science of our model? What is it and how do we derive the maximum benefit being there? Sa'i is emulating something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted from Hajar al salam uh, the wife of Nabi Ibrahim, Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, where she ran between the hillocks of Safa and Marwa, knowing that this was a barren desert, as Quran describes it, a place that was desolate, there was no vegetation, there were no people, there was no water source, etc. And she had this young infant son, Ismail, who was settled at the, at, at the Kaaba, and he was crying out in thirst, in hunger. So she looked at the horizon and she saw these two hillocks fairly close to the Kaaba and thought perhaps if I climb onto the hillock and look out towards the far horizon, I may see some distant travelers and I may be able to attract their attention. And she ran from the one hillock to the other, Safa being closer to the Kaaba, Marwa being a bit of a distance away, and she looked out to different sides of the horizon and found no one. And Allah loved this so much of this compassion that only a mother could have for a child mm. that he made this and sequenced this as one of the rituals that actually predates Islam that it was done at the time before Islam where they would have idols both at Safa and Marwa and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then put this as one of the rituals that we would undertake in the Hajj naturally with the idols removed from the mount or the hillock of Safa and Marwa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to emulate this practice of Hajj alayhi salam now how do we take benefit from it? so Safa and Marwa these two hillocks are known as places of acceptance of Dua we commence and we know it's seven rounds we commence at Safa and eventually will complete the seventh round at Marwa both of these being places of acceptance of Dua use each of these as the opportunity of invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings knowing that this ritual is always preempted by Tawaf so whether you're undertaking Umrah, the lesser pilgrimage, or Hajj in terms of coming to the Kaaba, before the Sa'i, there would always be a Tawaf. And in the human mind, the psyche would always incline one to say, I'm close to the end of this leg of my journey. Just get it done with. Yeah. And you need to fight that. And in fighting that, what, what has worked is that choose seven or eight categories of either people or dimensions of your life. So you can put some precision and some specific nature to the type of du'as that you make. So perhaps at Safa I would commence by making du'a for my parents, and then at Marwa for my spouse, and then back at Safa for my children, and then back at Marwa for my aunts and uncles, and then for my community and neighbors, etc. Which means that every time I've stood either on the hillock of, of Safa or Marwa, which is one at the start of every round, and then Marwa right at the end, eight occasions, I'd made specific dua for either eight categories of people or eight different dimensions or thoughts or ideas and do you find that's a lot better lots a lot more focused than just making a general dua at every time you get to the hillock that's a lot better because you take more out of it uh, as opposed to when you're making general duas you go on to what i refer to as autopilot mode mm. so you're reciting those duas and supplications that you're familiar with they just you know coming off your tongue and there's actually no thought that's informing them because you're so used to reciting them at the end of the prayer when you wake up in the morning etc etc and those are more general du'as mm. that you recite generally whereas here once again these are specific du'as and they convey to Allah who is ever watchful over you a sense of that you have planned that you have given thought that you have invested and hence you will be rewarded for this commencement. Now, now that's the du'as when you get between when you, when you when you're on the hills right hillocks uh, Safa and Marwa but in the interim as you as you walking or, or running what what should you be reciting then so when running between Safa and Marwa or making haste between Safa and Marwa and this is an act of ibadah of movement on your feet where they should be haste because you're emulating what Hajar al salam did so there one can recite anything one can recite Quran one can even have conversations conversations revolving around your relationship with Allah together with your spouse conversations around the upbringing of your children about your ambitions and aspirations together so anything done in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we give preference to the recitation of what we refer to as the first kalima la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu lahu mulk wa lahu alhamd yuhyi wa yumid biyadi al-khayr wa huma ala kulli shayin qadir there's none worthy of worship except Allah he is the living you know he will never ever die he's the one who gives life and he's the one who takes it away biyadi al-khayr in his hands is all good and he has power over everything and as I mentioned, this you could recite, but you could recite anything else. Knowing that there's an important stage in this movement between the two hillocks, uh, the area that's illuminated by green lighting. Mm -hmm. This used to be a valley in the time of Hajar al-Islam, 
the originator of, of Sa'i, as you may call it, where when she was running between the two hillocks, she could not see her young infant son Ismail at the Kaaba. And hence her gaze was fixed towards the Kaaba for that first moment when once again she would be able to guarantee, oh, my son is safe and there's no animal that's come from anywhere, etc. So if you truly wanted to emulate Hajj al -Salam, make haste and make sure that in the area illuminated by the green lights, irrespective of what you're reciting, that as best as possible, you incline your gaze towards the Kaaba. We think about our version of, of her Ismail, isn't it? Yes, part of what informs the du'as that we make at the hillocks of Safa and Marwa is the fact that she had compassion as a mother. So how can you have the same compassion in all the areas of responsibility or authority as a breadwinner, as a father, as an elder sibling, as a manager, etc., etc.?